Well, hello everybody. Welcome to Nature Live Online. My name is Alistair. I will be your host for today's show. Thank you very much for joining us today. If this is your first time joining, thank you. Let me tell you a little bit about what Nature Live Online is all about. Now, if you've ever visited the Natural History Museum in London, you may have come along to one of our shows in our own studio there. And it's an opportunity for you to meet some of the scientists that work behind the scenes with our collection. But of course, due to the current pandemic, we aren't able to run the shows in the studio anymore. So instead, we're taking them online so that you guys can continue to find out more about our wonderful collection and the research and, of course, the people that work at the museum. It's still fully interactive, though. So if you've got any questions for us today, please just send them in and we will try and get through as many of them as we can. Now, today's topic is all about life under the ice. We're taking a journey to Antarctica to find out a bit more about a form of life there that has had a huge impact on the Earth. In fact, it would be safe to say I don't think any of us would be here if it weren't for these little guys. We're going to be talking about cyanobacteria. And here to help me find out more about these guys is our researcher, Carla Greco. Thank you very much, Carla, for joining us today. How are you? Hi, Alistair. I'm good, thank you. How are you? I'm very good. It's great to see you. Thank you very much for, for coming along today. Um, so I mentioned we're going to be talking about cyanobacteria, but before we sort of dive into that topic, can you tell us a little bit about what you actually do at the museum on a day-to-day -day basis? So I am a PhD student at the museum in the life sciences department. And as you mentioned, I work on cyanobacteria. And I'm particularly interested in the adaptation of cyanobacteria to cold environments, and particularly Antarctica. Excellent. OK, well, there might be quite a few viewers who maybe aren't familiar with the term cyanobacteria. Can you tell us a little bit about, about what, what they are exactly? What do they look like? Uh, so cyanobacteria are small um, photosynthetic microorganisms, and we find them all around the world in terrestrial and aquatic environments. So we've got a picture of them here. We used to think that they were actually algae because they look a bit like microalgae and in fact their common name is blue-green algae due to their interesting color uh, but we now know that they are in fact bacteria and they're really old organisms they evolved around 2.5 billion years ago and um, they changed the environment of the earth um, by through the evolution of photosynthesis and they created a lot of oxygen in our atmosphere which led to what is known as the great oxygenation event um, and we find evidence of them in plenty of fossils. Um, but they're also really important now. We find them in plenty of environments and they're actually the most abundant photosynthetic organism in the world. And they're really good at surviving in extreme places as well. OK, so, yeah, they've got we, we owe them quite a lot then. If um, yeah. you say they're creating the oxygen, that of course, we breathe and most other organisms, it's vital for the, for them to to grow and, and to survive so they 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 have really changed the world and you mentioned two and a half billion years old as well so yes. are these is it fair to say these are some of the oldest living things on the planet yes they're some of the earliest life forms that we that we know of uh, incredible and we're going today to to look at the the research that you've in particular been doing in antarctica but can can we find these cyanobacteria all over the, the planet or is it just in in certain extreme places as you said like antarctica Cyanobacteria are everywhere. Um, we find them in just soils, in lakes around the UK. They're um, around, um, like, in our oceans. They're the most abundant phytoplankton in our oceans. Uh, so they are everywhere. But And that's because they're really good at surviving most environments. So we also find them in extreme places. But, yeah, they're around everywhere in the world. So we've got, you mentioned as well, they're, they're fossilised too. So we've got a mixture of some living examples that are still here today that we can actually see and explore and the remains of some of those original ones that were so important in creating the, the earth that we know today and um, if people wanted to find cyanobacteria today where, where could they go is there, is there a place they can go and see them so um i mentioned fossil cyanobacteria so we see cyanobacteria in the fossil record in structures that are known as stromatolites. So these are fossil structures that just look like layered structures, but they are the um, first example that we have of fossilized life. But we still find stromatolites to these day. So um, the picture that you can see here are actually modern stromatolites. So these rock structures are actually created by cyanobacteria so how this happens is that the cyanobacteria grow and then they trap sediment and this creates 
these structures that we're seeing here. So we get some really good examples of them in Shark Bay in Australia. We have some in the Bahamas, and we also get some very good examples in Antarctica. Fantastic, yeah, and incredible to think, like if I just walked across that, I think I would just assume they were rocks. I, I Honestly, I'm not sure I would have given them a second glance and not realized the, the, the significance behind what they actually are. Yeah, they're quite unassuming organisms, but those are in fact created by living organisms. They're not just any old rock. So you mentioned that you, you've been to Antarctica to study these. What is it about Antarctica particularly that is, is good for studying cyanobacteria? Because it's, as we'll find out in a little bit, it's not easy to get there. It, it takes a long time. It's a very, very uh, challenging environment to be in. Why do you go to Antarctica in particular to study these things? Uh, so Antarctica is a really good place to study cyanobacteria. Uh, Antarctic lakes, particularly um, ice-covered Antarctic lakes, so lakes that have a sheet of ice covering them all year round, um, are really good environments to study cyanobacteria because they're really low in disturbance. There's not much else there. So there's not, no fish, no animals grazing on the cyanobacteria because it's such an extreme place to live in. Um, and this allows the cyanobacteria to grow all over the bottom of the lake um, which means that we get them in very high abundance and they're also able to form structures that they wouldn't be able to without any uh, without other disturbances so it makes it a really good place to go and study cyanobacteria i'd love to go to antarctica i've never i've never been it's uh, it's obviously uh, it's very far away i'm not sure right now if we're going to be able to get there anytime soon given uh, what's going on in the world at the moment if any of you have been to antarctica let us know in the comments it'd be really interesting to to know your experiences but you know, what are the conditions like uh, down there? Because, you know, other than it being really cold, um, what, what's it like to, to be there? Uh, so, as you said, Antarctica is really cold. It's also um, quite dry in a lot of places, which sounds very strange because it's a continent that's covered in ice, uh, so water, but the water is mostly frozen. Um, and um, inside the lake, the conditions of the water uh, really difficult to live in. They're very extreme. So the water is really cold. It's less than one degree. Um, there's very low light in these lakes because they're covered in a sheet of ice. There's very low nutrients in the water column for organisms to survive on. Um, and some of the lakes can be extremely salty or can have an extremely alkaline pH. So they're very difficult places for an organism to survive in. Interesting. I wouldn't, have, I wouldn't have imagined lakes being salty. Are, you, are they saltier than the ocean then, for example? Because obviously a lot of uh, lakes live in the ocean, no, no bother at all. Uh, some lakes can be extremely salty, especially towards the bottom of the lake. Um, one lake in Antarctica is actually saltier than the Dead Sea. Wow. That's because so, yeah. the Dead Sea, of course, is famously salty. That So salty you can just float on the top. Yeah. Um, that's okay. Yeah, I can see what you mean by it's being uh, incredibly, an incredibly difficult environment to work in. So, you know, you've got to get under the ice. Um, what, what what were you doing there? Like we can see in the pictures here, it looks like you're you're obviously having to dig some holes. Do, do you then go diving um, to actually find these organisms? So we had um, a bunch of different activities that we were doing in Antarctica. We collected some sediments. We took cores of the ice of the lake and of the nearby glaciers. We also had a meteorological station that takes readings of the climate in the area. And yes, as you mentioned, we were also diving under the lake. So this is a picture of uh, Dale Anderson, the um, leader of the expedition and the chief diver who was diving below the um, ice cover of the lake to go collect samples from the bottom of the lake. So incredible. Did you do some diving yourself? Have you been... Uh, yeah, there? no, I did not do any diving, um, but it takes a big crew to actually um, get the um, diving activities happening. So I was um, actually connected um, by um, a communication line to Dale, so Dale could actually speak to us while he was underwater. So I had the job of um, listening to what he was saying and following his commands um, while he was under the water. Fantastic. Um, so we've had a question come in, um, uh, this one's from Graham, asking how deep is the lake uh, and with the lack of sunlight, how does the, the bacteria grow? Uh, so the lake is um, about 180 metres deep and they found cyanobacterial mats growing to about 130 
And the cyanobacteria can grow there because they're really efficient at photosynthesizing. So they've got some pigments in them, which is why they have um, the strange purple color. Uh, it's a particular pigment that they have that allows them to photosynthesize efficiently at really low levels of light. Fantastic. Thanks for your question, Jim. Let's um, we, let's have a look at this environment because it I, I, it's absolutely stunning. It's a very strange almost otherworldly place you know because looking at this this is this is a, a photograph underneath the ice uh, in the lake isn't it but it it honestly looks like it, it might have been made by an artist or something it's such a strange looking environment so um what we're looking at here is underneath the um ice cover of the lake um this is the bottom of the lake and what we're looking at here are microbial mats of cyanobacteria and some other bacteria and small mammals like tardigrades, small mammals, small animals like tardigrades and rotifers. Um, and they're forming these um, interesting structures. Um, they're growing all along the bottom of the lake. And through um, trapping of sediment and the growth of the cyanobacteria, they're forming these really intricate shapes under the lake. Incredible. And we can see some footage here of actually doing the diving. And it just looks it looks incredible like it's such a a peaceful calm environment like there's not there doesn't seem like at least at a first glance that there's a lot going on i guess is that one of the reasons why this is such a, a special place to go and sample these things is you know you're not seeing things you know fish and other things kind of disturbing this this environment yes there's a really um undisturbed peaceful location which is what is allowing the cyanobacteria and the bacteria to grow and form these really intricate structures Incredible, excellent. Uh, we've got a few more questions coming in, so let's we'll take a few of these while while this is playing. Um, thank you very much, guys, for your questions. Do keep them coming. We'll try and answer as many of them as we can. Um, so this one, um, this one comes from uh, Noah, age six, uh, and they're asking what lives under the ice. So we were just seeing there. We've got lots of the cyanobacteria creating these beautiful um, lake beds. Um, is there much else down there in addition to to the bacteria? So we've got the cyanobacteria that are the big part of these mats and they're growing um, to form these mats. But we also have um, some algae, we have some tardigrades, some rotifers, uh, some nematodes, and then of course other bacteria that are growing in these communities. So some of these are perhaps organisms that people won't be immediately familiar with. They may not have heard of them before. Is that because a lot of the, are we talking microscopic organisms here not yes not you need a, a microscope to look at most of them right but there's a lot of them then so these lakes are perhaps more lively than maybe it yeah. first appears yeah there's a lot more diversity of life a lot more growing that you would expect in such an extreme environment excellent great and um, another question uh, this one coming from youtube um, what is the minimum temperature underwater in antarctica um so i'm guessing well it's frozen on the top, but it's not underneath because that's, of course, how you can yeah. dive. So it's maybe not as cold as we we imagine. So the, the temperatures under the water are uh, just above freezing. So they're just less than one degrees. And the ice cover is um, constantly freezing and then the top of it is melting. So, yeah, it's always just just above freezing temperatures. So, yeah, it's make sure you've got the right gear on i guess yeah. it's not not going to be a comfortable environment i always think it's funny actually I, I i think swimming under ice is something that i always think is it's like i've had nightmares about it that I'm <laughs> swimming and then you know you can't get back to the the little opening that you came down in or it's frozen over and you can't find it again that's the stuff i've had nightmares about i, I don't think i could do it <laughs> well dale is connected by a um by a tether by a rope so he'll always be able to find the right his way back yeah so he doesn't have to worry about that and, it, and it's not going to freeze over before you can do no. that thankfully. yeah excellent um another question this one from kate on facebook um how do the cyanobacteria cope with the pressure at the bottom of the lake because you mentioned it was i think about 180 meters deep was that correct um does does that water pressure affect them at all um, not particularly. So they will have some adaptations that allow the proteins to maintain the structure of the pressure. Cytobacteria also produce um, kind of a mucus around them, which will help to protect them from the pressure. So yeah, they'll have um, adaptations that help them cope uh, with the increased pressure below the lake. Fantastic. So 
you know, as well as obviously these organisms are quite interesting in and of themselves. Um, they're, they're, as you mentioned at the beginning of the show, they're they're hugely important in the uh, the evolution of, of life on Earth. We wouldn't have had almost anything else if it weren't for these guys creating that oxygen that got everything else kick started. But apart from that sort of academic interest, there's a lot of practical interest as well, isn't there? There's you know these these uh, organisms could actually have some useful applications to us in some quite unusual ways, couldn't they? So, um, yeah, you're right. Um, studying how these organisms, how bacteria and cyanobacteria are adapted to the cold can have some really interesting implications for biotechnology. So I have previously mentioned proteins. So these organisms will have some interesting proteins and enzymes, which we could then uh, harness and use in everyday products um, like um, washing powder. Um, that yeah, so learning from cyanobacteria can actually have some implications in um, our future products. I love the idea that something like our washing powder in our washing machines, you know, you, you see all these things, you know, advertising that, you know, it works at a low temperature, you know, enzymes allow, you know, breaks down enzymes at low temperatures, so you don't have to have a hot wash on, it uses less energy, that kind of thing. And that sort of technology is coming from these, these things at the bottom of an Antarctic lake. Uh, yeah, so we can learn from these uh, organisms that live in extreme places to actually use in our everyday life, which is incredible. Brilliant. Um, another question, this one just coming on uh, from Periscope. Is there anything living inside the ice itself? That's an interesting question, because obviously, yeah, we're looking at what's going on underneath it, but that- Yeah, there's that a really interesting- ice. That's a lot of ice, isn't it? Is there anything in there? Yeah, so there will still be bacteria living within the ice itself and there they've got interesting adaptations which stop them from freezing so you can actually melt the ice and look at what's living in there okay so there you go so it, it seems wherever you look you're going to find some form of life somewhere which is is remarkable so let's talk a little bit i'm, I'm really keen to kind of get a bit more of a, an idea of what it feels like to be working in that environment because antarctica you know it's 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 remote it's it's hostile certainly from the point of view of of humans the bacteria seem to love it but it's it's not easy for us to to go there so you know tell us a bit about you know how did you, you you've been out to antarctica yourself to find yes. these things how, how did you get there for a start and wh where exactly in antarctica did you go so the site that we were studying is called lake antazi and it is in east antarctica so just below south africa um, and we actually got there by plane so this is the lake itself. Um, it's one of the largest lakes in Antarctica. It's surrounded by the Gruber Mountains and you can see a glacier just on the north side of the lake. So to get to Antarctica, we took a plane from Cape Town, which actually lands directly on the ice. So it uh, lands on an ice runway. Um, so all of the people that were going to work for the station and all of our cargo uh, was on the plane and that's how we got there. Then from the uh, Antarctic uh, a station that we were staying in. We, some of our team got um, um, snowmobiles, so skidoos, all the way to the lake. And some of us were in a track vehicle uh, and it was about an eight hour journey to get to the field site. Eight hours on the ice, that's that's a long journey. Um, yeah, and I'm just thinking for us, you said that you, the plane landed directly on the ice. Can you imagine if we were landing it? Heathrow Airport, and they said it was uh, the the runway was covered in ice. We'd be terrified. Is, is it a bit a bit nerve wracking, you know, landing a plane on a sheet of ice? It was definitely a strange experience. I, I remember my first experience of stepping off the plane. I'd just come from Cape Town, so it was really warm, and I, I got off, and it was minus five degrees, and could see ice everywhere. Uh, so it was a really strange, strange experience. Uh, yeah, an awful lot of blue and white, as we can see yeah. in the photos, um, you know, very um, wide horizons and um, a lot of, uh, I guess you've got to wear sunglasses a lot because in the photos it's very yeah. sunny. Um, it actually, the weather actually looks quite nice if you never mind that it's so cold. So yeah, it was what, really sunny a lot of the time, so sunglasses were necessary. And what were the living conditions like? So you mentioned that you, um, there's a research station, but there was a very long journey to actually get to the site that you were interested in. So what, what, you know, what were you living in when you were there? So we, uh, for most of the expedition, we actually camped on the lake and in the surrounding mountains. So we spent um, just over a month in tents. Um, uh, yeah, so we camped while we were there. 
And um, we had to bring everything with us that we needed, both for science and to live. So we brought all of our food along with us um, and we ate mostly freeze dried food. Um, yeah, so it was a very remote place to be working in. And you've got to carry all your gear. How, how long How long do you spend camping out on the, on the ice? Uh, so I, I think we spent four weeks in total camping on the ice with a couple of weeks either side at the research station to prepare all of our equipment. And is it is it as cold as, like, you know, because we see in, in the images we've seen, it's obviously very sunny um, and you're there in the Antarctic summer, I guess, because that the conditions will be a bit more bearable than if you were there in the middle of winter. What kind of temperatures are you dealing with sort of day in, day out as you're working? So I think most people, when they picture going to Antarctica, they picture minus 30 constant snowstorms. But actually in summer, it is a lot warmer. So I think the coldest temperature that we got would have been around minus 10. For a lot of, of the time, it was minus five. And we even got some days above freezing. Um, we had some days of bad weather, but for a lot of the time, it was actually incredibly sunny. And it is sunny all, all day long um, during the mid of summer is 24 hour sunlight on the continent. So you can see that like, you can see the tents that you're in. Um, it's I'm just thinking because you're camped directly on the ice. Does that not make your tent really, really cold that you're literally sleeping on the on the on the top of the lake? So we had wooden platforms that the tents were put on. So it was some insulation to the cold. Um, tents actually get, when it's really sunny, the inside the tents get re really warm um, because the sun heats up the tents. So it's actually not that uncomfortable. And of course, we're uh, all in our polar field gear. So we've got big jackets, big boots uh, to wear. So um, temperature wasn't too much of a problem. Well, that's good. And actually the temperatures you quoted, I mean, they're not too dissimilar to temperatures you get in the UK, for example, in, in, in our winter. So. I guess, yeah, if you've got the right um, uh, uh, cold weather gear, it's not too, it's not too bad. Yeah, I, I didn't find it too difficult. Yeah. Excellent. Um, so thank you guys for your questions. Let's, uh, let's uh, go through some of these because we've got some really nice ones uh, that folk have been, uh, been asking. So uh, this one uh, comes from uh, Stephen on Facebook. They're asking, did you manage to take cores? And if so, what did you learn? Uh, I presume they mean ice cores. So we took cores um, through the um, yeah through ice cores, which some researchers used to um, model the age of the lake and uh, to look at um, the properties of the water and of the ice. We also took cores through the um, bottom of the microbial mats and going all the way down into the sediment, which is what we could use to actually date the age of the um, microbial mats and the sediments of the lake. Actually, I don't think, yeah, that's quite interesting. How old was the the cyanobacteria you were looking at? Uh, so the uh, mats are really slow growing. So through radiocarbon dating, they've actually estimated that about 10 centimeters of growth is 2,500 years. Wow. Uh, yeah, in the mats, so they're really old. That's, yeah, very slow growing, which I guess isn't surprising in an environment that's not yeah. got very much light it doesn't change very much it's very calm very stable very quiet um and they're just slowly slowly doing their thing but yeah incredible time scales and, and ages that we're talking about here um great uh, another question here this one um comes from Anne on facebook uh, Anne's asking does creating that opening in which the diver enters could that opening damage the cyanobacteria by introducing foreign substances and air pollution that could harm them that's yeah that's that's the point actually about you know, what is it they say, as soon as you observe or study something, you change it. Um, that I guess that could be a real risk here. So the group that started the project are um, extremely careful and um, extremely experienced Antarctic researchers. So we do everything to mitigate the um, impacting the environment below. Um, so yeah, opening the um, hole could uh, impact the environment slightly, but although the ice cover is um, is on top of the lake. There is actually still a bit of exchange of um, microorganisms and the environment into the lake. So it doesn't impact the lake as a whole too much. Um, and we actually, do have plan to mitigate impacting the environment. Yeah, and that's made me think as well. Are the, those structures that we saw earlier um, in the video and in the, in the photographs, are they 
are they quite delicate? You know, because you've mentioned they've grown incredibly slowly over over thousands and thousands and millions of years, you know, and then you send a diver in. Now, I'm sure, you know, everyone is extremely careful, but, you know, if you were to accidentally, you know, bash an elbow or, or kick your leg, you know, could you end up, you know, wrecking something that took thousands of years to, to grow? Yeah, that is always a worry. So the structures, unlike the first dramatolites that we saw, which were hard rock, the structures underneath the lake are um, soft structures that are made out of clay. So the sediments within the structures of clay. So they are um, a lot softer. So they are quite fragile. Obviously, they're um, used to living in a, an environment with very low disturbance. But um, yeah, and Dale is uh, very careful to yeah, to, to go with, uh, minimize uh, impact on on that incredible place. Um, great. Another question. This one's um, uh, asking uh, from Facebook. Why are there no other life except microscopic in the lake? So yeah, we talked a bit about other things earlier that that were in there, but you mentioned I think all the examples you gave were of microscopic organisms. Uh, why is that? Uh, well, first of all, it's a really difficult environment to live in, so not much else can really survive in um in the lakes so um it's also been covered by ice for the past 500 years so there hasn't been much chance to introduce much else but yeah the main reason is because not much else apart from microscopic life can survive there because it's so extreme yeah you talked yeah. about it's very dark um it's very salty as well i remember you saying that so, you know, not the particular lake that we studied isn't um a particularly salty lake but some of the ones in antarctica are the lake that we study has also got a really alkaline ph which makes it very difficult for other organisms to live in as well right. okay so there you go thank you very much for your questions we've got a few more um that we'll we'll go through here this one uh, from matthew h Lund saying um do the cyanobacteria also live in hot temperatures such as the Mid-Atlantic Rift? That's a good question, because yeah, you, you talked about, they, they, they seem perfectly adapted to environments that to you and I would be completely hostile and inhospitable. Um, they've adapted well to the cold. Have some also adapted then to the hot? Yes, that's a really good question. So just like we find cold adapted cyanobacteria, we actually find hot adapted cyanobacteria. So in some of um, the um, hot lakes that you find in America, uh, um, you find lots of cyanobacteria that are also adapted to living in really hot places. Um, so yeah, so they're very good at adapt adapting to both extremes, both the cold and to extremely hot places. Good stuff, which actually leads me on to my next question that I want to talk a little bit about was the, the impact of something like climate change. You know, we hear about this a lot in the media at the moment um, and it, places like Antarctica, and the Arctic, you know, these these um, very cold places are, they stand to be disproportionately affected by any changes in, in global temperatures. You know, having been there yourself, did you notice any evidence of the climate change having an impact on the lake that you were studying? Uh, so as, as we all know, climate change is having a really big impact on the planet and actually it's warming the poles faster than it's warming the rest of the earth. Um, it's been estimated that in Antarctica, some of the um, the ice-free areas might actually increase by 25% in the by the end of the next decade. Um, so, and we are actually, as researchers, seeing the impacts of climate change ourselves. And we saw this at Lake Untersea. So, researchers have noticed that the number of days above freezing have increased. And we actually last year, when we were at the lake, we saw that the lake expanded due to meltwater coming in. And we are not sure about how this is gonna impact the organisms uh, underneath the lake, but we're sure it's gonna have some impact, particularly if the ice cover of the uh, lake melts and, and uh, moat forms around the edges. This will change the chemical properties of the water um, quite a lot, and um, it might even um, create a transfer of other organisms into the lake. So yeah, it could really affect the community that lives below the lake and the structures that the cyanobacteria form. So yeah, these these um, structures that have taken so long to build, I guess if the if that water chemistry changes too much, then they won't be able to grow. Could they even deteriorate and, and die? And then we, we lose that environment that's taken such a long time to, to grow. 
Um, yeah, if the water uh, chemistry changes dramatically, it is possible that we could lose these structures, um, especially if the t types of organisms that um, live underneath the lake change, then this will change what the bed of the lake looks like. So yeah, so it's a possibility. So I'm wondering, like, so this this is, this, we've had another question come in. I'm just wondering, thinking, so sort of loop, looping this in with um, uh, climate change as well. So this question came from uh, Graham on Facebook. They're asking, what current percentage of all global oxygen can we thank uh, from science cyanobacteria? Because I'm following on from that, I wanted to ask if, if the cyanobacteria in these environments dies off because of climate change, is that going to affect how much oxygen we have to breathe? Um, so the organisms underneath the lake, we, um, most of the oxygen they produce stays trapped within the lake, but cyanobacteria as a whole, um, I can't give you the number off the top of my head, but um, phytoplankton and particularly uh, cyanobacteria that are part of the, the uh, group of phytoplankton produce most of the oxygen in our atmosphere. We tend to think about trees as the oxygen producers, but it's actually phytoplankton in the ocean that produce most of our oxygen. Uh, so yeah, the impact of climate change on phytoplankton and on cyanobacteria will have a big effect on um, our planet as a whole. Gosh, yeah. I mean, when you start thinking about it, it's, you almost don't want to think about what the ripple, we, we, we probably can't even predict what some of the ripple effects yeah. would be um, in the long term. Uh, we may not even be alive to see to see what those changes are, of course, as well. Uh, so yeah, thank you. Good questions there. Um, this is another question coming on off uh, from Periscope. How do cyanobacteria survive the long polar night? Do they hibernate? So yeah, so you were there in the summer, which is a relatively calm, mild period to be studying them. Um, in winter, of course, there's no, in Antarctica, of course, famously, there's very little sunlight, if any at all, for part of the year. How do they survive during that period? So that is a really good question. Um, it's quite difficult to study cyanobacteria, particularly in the lake, in winter because obviously the um, the conditions change quite a lot and it's quite difficult to run an expedition in the middle of winter in Antarctica. But we do know that um, cyanobacteria will tend to grow in summer when there's light available and then become dormant over uh, polar nights. So they sometimes may form some resting stages that allow them to survive the winter or um, they will uh, stop growing um, and then start up again when all the light is available. Right, so they do, they don't sort of hibernate in that sense, but they do have a- Not in, not in the animal growth. sense, but they are dormant, yeah. Yeah, excellent. Um, and this is another question. So this is going back to, um, you talked earlier about um, the, uh, the protein, uh, there's proteins in the set of bacteria that are of interest to researchers like yourself. Uh, and this question is asking, is the protein extracted from the bacteria renewable? Um, um, I'm, I'm guessing, can you keep making it? I guess is maybe the question. The, the bacteria will keep growing. So it is a, a renewable source in, in the sense that the, you'll have a culture that's growing and you'll ex extract some of protein from some of the organisms but the organisms themselves you'll still get it's not a finite source the um bacteria will keep growing okay there we go um so yeah we can keep keep using it um this one from ashley on facebook what's the coldest reported temperature in antarctica um that's a good oh. sort of trivia question isn't it i don't know, oh, if, I, uh, if, you know I don't what, know if i can tell you that off the top of my head um but it is very cold it will be in the like minus 50s <laughs> It's yeah. I, I think I, I you know I used to know this and I can't remember. I think it's somewhere around. I want to say around sort of minus eighty that kind of yeah. um, region. I but don't quote me on it. Um, but yeah, I mean that kind of temperature is frighteningly cold. Um, you, you wouldn't want to be in that for very long. Yeah. But I guess you, you've been in the summer and the, the difference in temperature is huge, isn't it? What's the coldest yeah. you said that you'd experienced there in the summer? Minus ten, I think, is the coldest. Yeah, minus ten, still uncomfortable i don't think most of us would really like it but certainly more tolerable than something like minus 50 or minus 80. but um there are people um some of the uh, research stations actually stay open over polar winter so there will be some people who have experienced really really cold temperatures in antarctica yeah i think if you want to experience it anywhere else you need to find a good walk-in freezer 
<laughs> that's like really cold. I think there's there's one at the museum that you can walk in that's um, that's uh, gives you a little taste. I remember it being physically painful standing in there, um, but then of course I didn't have all the the cold weather gear on that I would want. Um, so thanks guys for your questions. We, we've got a bit more time, so we'll try and get through as many of these as we can before we before we wrap up. Um, this one, uh, let me see what we've got here. So this one is from Facebook. Uh, how many groups of cyanobacteria uh, exist on Earth? Um, so it's quite a big question off the top of my head. Um, they've got different ways of classifying uh, bacteria because um, so you'll have thousands of species. It's a really, really big group. And then we can categorize them into like different types of cyanobacteria. So I think we've got about like six main groups, but in terms of species, it's thousands. Yeah, it's incredible actually thinking about it. Like, and I'm sure many people watching as well, you know, have an interest in the natural world and things like that. And when we, you know, if you were to list, list as many different kind of animals, plants, bacteria, fungi, all the forms of life you can, and we can't even get close to it because, we're yeah. looking at like a group like cyanobacteria, which have been so fundamental to all the other life that we, we might talk about. You know, it's we, you couldn't list them all. There's just so many. Yeah, we're things. still finding new species all the time and still redefining what the groups are because um, although some of them may look very similar, they're genetically quite different. And we're yeah, we're still working out the evolution of a cyanobacteria. So still plenty of work to do uh, yes. in this area, yeah, excellent. Um, this question from Marie says, my daughter Tilly, uh, aged 11, would like to know how thick is the ice on top of the lake? So I think you mentioned that earlier. It's it's quite a lot, isn't it? So it's a, around uh, an average of three meters across the lake. So in some areas it's two, in some areas it's four, but on average it's about three meters of thick solid ice on top of the lake. And is that thick enough that when you were camping on the ice, were you, comfortable it's like yeah this isn't going to yeah crack. Exactly. i'm not going to get a real awakening <laughs> one night <laughs> so we had a large um sea container and one of the track vehicles so basically a big antarctic tractor can drive on top of the lake so it's really really thick ice i mean you've just said as well you can land airplanes on ice but i guess you don't do that on the lake <laughs> not on top of the lake <laughs> <laughs> that's maybe a little bit too much eh? um excellent thank you uh, tilly for that question uh, Lindsay on Facebook is asking how many people would go on a typical expedition? So it varies between expeditions. Our expedition was a party of six. So there were six of us that spent um, a month together working. Um, research stations can often have up until like hundreds to a thousand people at, at the peak of summer. Uh, so and But you can also get expeditions of just two people. Uh, in Antarctica, so it really depends on what the expedition was. Gosh, two people! That, that I hope you like the person you're with. That's that's, <laughs> that's pretty hardcore if you're in Antarctica with one other person and there's no one for thousands of miles. Um, but yeah, it, so it, I guess it's in some places it must there must be quite a hub of activity around these research stations, especially in the summer, as you say, with a lot of researchers like yourself coming in to to do work like this. Uh, yeah, so uh, the uh, American research station is really big it's almost like a small little town uh, but then some of the other ones are really small which have a maximum of eight people uh, at the peak of summer so it really depends on um, the stations. but antarctic research is really like, vibrant and interesting community of people to work with and very international as well isn't it because yes. you know there's people from you, you mentioned that you know uh, you're coming from the uk but you you flew into a, a russian um, uh, research base so like yeah it's that international collaboration is really what Antarctica is all about isn't yeah. it? Yes yeah, so we had a group of Canadians, Americans, Russians uh, and me from the UK working in one uh, expedition together so it was really really interesting. Great cool okay we've got a few more questions um, to go so let me um, we'll, we'll rattle through some of these Carla if you don't mind. Um, uh, so this uh, next question uh, from Facebook, uh, are the cyanobacteria toxic? Um, that's an interesting point. I guess, well, I guess, do we mean toxic to people or toxic to other things or the environment? So it's a really interesting question, actually, because um, a lot of people associate cyanobacteria that you get in the rivers in the UK with toxins that are toxic to people. So they can either like um, 
make rashes or they can make people ill if they drink them. And we still, we're still not sure if the cyanobacteria under these lakes are toxic. We're still testing them. So we found evidence in some Antarctic environments of cyanobacteria that can produce these toxins, but we're still we're still again waiting for results on this lake. So watch this space. Maybe next year I'll have an answer for you. Good question there. So we're still still actively researching that one. Yeah. Uh, this question from Mary, how long do cyanobacteria live? Do they have a small lifespan? Uh, so cyanobacteria do not themselves as a single organism live for very long. In the cultures that I have uh, growing in the lab, um, they tend to uh, survive for about um, a month. Um, so that's the cells, con like new cells forming and um, some cells dying. And then I have to uh, refresh the media that they live in. So yeah, they don't have a very long lifespan as individuals. But as um, large cultures and large structures like the microbial mats, they can survive for a really long time. Excellent. So yeah, collectively they, they live for, yeah. well, they've existed in some forms for Millions and millions of billions of years, even so. Yeah, they're doing they're doing something right. Yeah, <laughs> fantastic. Um, uh, very quickly, this is another one. Uh, Timothy, aged eight, asks how many uh, things live under the ice. So we've touched on this a couple of times as well. I guess we don't know the exact number. It's probably impossible to know, but there's a lot of different yeah. things under there that's microscopic. Yeah. Is that right? Yes. So it's a lot of different things. In my um, recent study that I did, I found, I think it was about would have been about um, 500 different, um, more or less species. They, some of them can be very similar, um, but they're all um, like small microorganisms. So I don't have a definite number of how many organisms live there. Yeah, that's, that's a tough question, Timothy, to know yeah. how many of these really tiny things, but uh, it's certainly a lot. But I think there's a good point there to make about, I don't think most of us in our sort of day to day lives actually think or appreciate about the incredible diversity of microscopic life. You know, we think about, when we think about diversity of life, we, I think we always gravitate towards things like the mammals and the birds and the fish and so on, which, you know, they look, they're easy to see, they look beautiful, but actually the diversity of microscopic life is enormous. Like it must like absolutely dwarf anything else, but because it's a lot harder to see, it's not at the forefront of our minds in the same way. Yes, there's an incredible diversity of uh, microbial life and small things that we can only see under the microscope and some things that we can't even see under the microscope. And they're all um, using nutrients in a different way that some of them are photosynthesizing, some of them are only respiring and they, um, yeah, so they're really, really diverse organisms, but maybe sometimes they're a bit overlooked because obviously we can't see them. Yeah, well, yeah, it's. Uh, it, I think there's a lot of great research to to do, and I think as the years go on, we're going to discover more and more about that that world and and the lake that you've you've been uh, visiting as well. I'm sure we'll build up an even more detailed picture about what's actually living in there. Um, so I'm going to take one last question from you guys. Thank you very much for all your questions. This one uh, came in from Periscope. Uh, will we have new pests and diseases as the tundra thaws? And uh, very topical here, will more pandemics result from this thaw? So that's an interesting one. You know, we talk about microorganisms, isn't it? And, you know, as if as the environment changes, whether that's through direct human intervention or climate change, could we start seeing new things emerging from these environments that might affect um, It is possible. I, I don't think I'm the best person to answer this question, but it is true that they've found some... Um, other viruses and some microorganisms that have been uh, defrosted uh, from the ice. But whether this is going to cause any other pandemics, I'm I'm not I'm not too sure. Who knows? Yeah, big big question mark there. We've got a lot uh, a lot still to learn. But um, thank you very much, guys, for all your questions. It's been lovely uh, to to receive them, and thank you, Carla, as well, for taking the time to to answer some of them. Some tough ones in there for you, but you did uh, you did a good job. Um, before before we we sign off, I just wanted to ask if you had any plans to go back um, and and continue working, because I imagine at the moment traveling is a bit tricky uh, given uh, the pandemic, but uh, do you hope yeah. to go back to Antarctica and uh, and do some more uh, research there? Uh, I'd, I'd absolutely love to go back. So there's always hope for another expedition in the future. Uh, and I'd, I'd be really keen to go back. Uh, yeah. Excellent. 
Great. Well, um, all the best uh, uh, in your research. I hope it goes well. And thank you very much for, for joining us today and answering all of our questions. Really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Alistair. Great. Take care. And thank you guys as well for joining us today. Hope you've enjoyed the show and, uh, and learned a bit more about perhaps a form of life that you've not really thought about or considered before. It's been great answering all your questions. So many thanks for, for sending them in. If you enjoyed the show and want to find out more about uh, the work that our researchers at the Natural History Museum in London are doing, then you can join us every Tuesday and Friday. It's a different topic with a different speaker every day. Uh, and we are always happy to take any of your questions in the show. So thank you very much for joining us today. And we hope to see you again very soon.